Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Godot Game Lab. In this video, we will design the boss fight for the game while also providing a win condition so when we defeat the boss, we can close the game loop by going back to the main menu and deciding if we want to start a new run again or quit the game. So let's see how the boss fight works. The boss is called Toxic Ghost and on his first turn he always busts himself, so he gains 2 muscle. Then he has a special attack action which does two things, it damages me for 10 and also adds a garbage card to my draw pile, as you'll see in a second. So if I end my turn here, I'll take 10 damage and one card gets added to my draw pile which is this one. It's called Toxin and it does nothing but pollutes your deck and it costs 1 mana to get rid of. So if I play this now, you can see that it didn't reappear in my discard pile because it exhausted when I played it. The Toxic Ghost also has a blocking action which blocks for 10 and also he not just buffs himself once but when I play a new card here you can see that it goes into the buffing state. So he buffs himself on the first turn and once when his HP reaches 25 or below. So again he buffs himself with 2 muscle and if I play the game you can see that this action now does 12 damage and keeps adding that garbage to my deck. So if I end my turn here, I take 12 and again a Toxin card was added to my deck. So if I play this, I can get rid of it, I can kill that boss enemy and if I click on Awesome, I have this new win screen where we say that the warrior is victorious. If I click on Main Menu, I can start a new run or exit the game. So we sort of closed the game loop with this. Awesome, so let's get started. First of all, let's see how the new enemy that boss fight, the Toxic Ghost, will work. We'll add a new mechanic to the game called Toxin Card, which is really similar to what Slimed does in State Aspire. So it's a one cost card which exhausts immediately, but it costs one mana to play, and it basically pollutes your deck with garbage. The enemy itself will have three actions one is called the Buff Action with which the Toxic Ghost buffs himself with two stacks of muscle. He also has an attack action, which besides doing damage to you, adds a Toxin card to your draw pile. And last but not least, he has like a standard blocking action. A more interesting bit is how we can put together the AI for the Toxic Ghost. So here's what I came up with. So first of all, he always buffs himself on turn one, but there's another part of the battle when he decides to buff himself and it's when the HP of the ghost goes below or reaches 25 and it's also true that he only buffed himself once during the battle, namely on turn 1. So that part of the condition prevents the ghost from buffing himself over and over again when he goes below 25. So if that boolean expression is true, then he has to do the buffing action Otherwise, we do a random roll and decide between the attack action and the block action and it's a more aggressive boss because of buffing himself and using that pollution tactic with a toxin card. He has 65% chance of attacking the player and 35% chance of blocking for a turn. So let's see how we can do this. Okay, so I have my project open here, why don't we start creating the new boss. So in the file system doc, we can expand our enemies folder and you can see that we have our bat and our crab enemies there. So let's right click on the enemies folder, create a new folder and call it toxic underscore ghost. Now we can select this new folder, right click on it and create a new resource and search for enemy. So we'll create an enemy stats resource representing the toxic ghost. We can call this toxic ghost.tres. Now if we expand this new folder, you can see that we have our enemy stats resource here. Let's double click to open it up in the inspector. And we can set these two properties under the stats. So we can set the max HP to whatever we like. I'll just use 40. And for the art, we can click on the arrow and load something from the art folder. For this one, I'll use this ghost sprite right here. And you can see that we have an AI slot, which is empty. And if you remember, we have to define the AI as a packed scene, namely a couple of nodes connected together. So that's what we'll do next. Let's press Ctrl Shift O to quick open a scene and search for enemy action picker because this is the scene which is sort of a starting point when we design a new enemy. 
if we open our enemy action picker, you can see that we only have one node, this enemy action picker node, but it does have a script attached to it. So this is why we open it up and save it as another scene. So let's just go to scene, save scene as, and we can go back to the root folder, go to our enemies, toxic ghost, and we can just rename this to toxic underscore ghost underscore AI. Okay, so now we have our new scene here. And we can rename the root node to toxic ghost AI as well. And if you remember in itself, this enemy action picker is responsible for handling all the logic regarding picking what action to do during a turn, but the actions themselves need to be defined inside this. So let's add a new child node to this by clicking on a plus sign or pressing control A. And this time we don't need to search because we want to add a single node. We can rename this to muscle buff action and we can duplicate this two times and rename the last one to block action and the middle one to attack action as well awesome but these are just plain old nodes right here so we need to attach a script to them right so let's select muscle buff action click on the attach script button and this time we want to use a template because we do have a script template for enemy actions and we can also rename this to toxic ghost muscle buff action .gd in snake case and we can click on create and we have this starter template now let's see how we can implement this muscle buff action for this enemy and let's start by deleting what we don't need so for this one we don't want to use updated modifier based intent text because this is just a buffing action there are no numbers involved so we can delete all this and also we don't really want to tween here so we can just delete the tweening part as well inside the perform action method now here's what we need first of all we'll need a constant and preload the muscle status because we want to add that muscle status to the toxic ghost then we can use an export variable called stacks per action or something like that just to make sure that we can tweak this from the editor and then we have two member variables although the first one could be an export variable as well it's called hp threshold and that's the hp the ghost needs to reach to do its second buff action and we'll also have a member variable called usages which keeps track of how many times we perform that action to make sure that we can only do it twice during the whole fight and since this action is a conditional based one it's not a chance or a role based one we need to override the is performable method and return a boolean when that condition is met so first of all we'll create a variable called hp under threshold which will be a boolean value and we just check if the enemy's stats health property is less than or equal to the hp threshold we just declared and then we check for those conditions so if either the usage's value is zero meaning that we didn't have our first turn yet to do it or when the usage is equal to one and we are under that hp threshold we increment that usage's variable by one and return true meaning that we can do this buffing action otherwise we can just return false because there are no other cases when this action is applicable and inside that perform action method what we do is we create a new status effect we duplicate the muscle status resource change the amount of stacks to the stacks per action variable set the status effects status to this new duplicated resource and execute it on the enemy then we play the sound effect and emit the enemy action completed signal just like we do for all the actions and that's pretty much it we can save this with Control s and if we go back to 2d view let's not forget that we need to set up this action in the inspector as well right so first of all, we'll create a new intent for this because it's empty for now. Let's click on the arrow and create a new intent. And we don't really want to use text for this, but we can set an icon. So click on load again, go to the art folder. And I'll just use this red potion like thing here as an intent. For the sound, we can also quick load something. I've just used the enemy block sound for this but you can for sure add more sound effects to the game to make it more juicy and we don't really have to tinker with the chance in this case because the type of this enemy action should remain conditional right because we just provided that is performable method so that's all the setup we need for the buff action 
and we can save this with Control S. The next thing we want to do is the attack action. However, it's not just a common attack action, which we are used to by now for the other enemies, but it also adds a Toxin card to the player's deck. So we have to create that card first, right? But we cannot really put it inside the character's folder because it's not really related to a specific character. All the characters in the game can have this Toxin card. So what I ended up doing is right clicking the root folder, create new folder and created a new folder called common cards for all the cards which are shared between the characters. And inside that new folder, if we select it, we can right click on it, create a new resource. And this time we search for card.gd. And we can call this toxin.tres. Okay, so if we expand this folder and double click on our toxin card, we have all the export variables right here. So how does this work? First of all, we can change the ID to Toxin. We can change the type to Skill, for example. It's for sure targeted at the player itself and it costs one. And the cool thing about this is we provided this exhausts functionality, right? And if I just check this exhausts checkbox here, it means that we actually don't have to script anything because how we want this card to work is if I don't play it, then it remains in my deck and does nothing but occupies some space. But if I do play it, it costs one mana, but it goes out of my draw and discard piles, right? And with the exhaust functionality, we can easily do this and we don't even have to change the default script because for this card, it finds that it does nothing, right? So we can set the icon next, load something, maybe this green portion here. And for the tooltip text, it can be very simple, something like slows you down. And that's all we really need because for this one, we don't need a script just because we have our exhaust functionality prepared for us. We can also add a sound effect if we want to. I'll just quick load the true strength sound effect for this one. And that's all we really need. So we can save this with Control S and now we have a card which is very similar to what Slimed does in State Aspire. And now we can do the attack action for the Toxic Ghost. So if we select the attack action node, it's the same deal. We attach a script to it. It's an enemy action template and we can rename this to Toxic ghost attack action .gd. and the only lines we don't really need here are those two because we want to create that damage animation and we can also get rid of the comments because we don't really need them we already know what update intent text does okay so how we can do this first of all we'll provide the constant called toxin and we preload the new card we just created then we provide an export variable for the damage which will be 8 by default then inside in perform action we provide an extra check making sure that the target is a valid player because we want to add to the draw pile of the player right and if it's not we can return from this function immediately then after declaring all those twin related variables we provide a bunch of new ones, we'll create a new damage effect, we create a target array which has the size of 1 and it just includes that target which is the player, then we get the damage dealt modifier of the enemy itself to make sure that we have the modified damage because remember this ghost will buff itself right? Then we'll set the amount to the damage effect and the sound effect and then we can start the tweening. So first we move to the position where the player is, then we execute the damage effect, and then probably this is the interesting bit here. So we also call here the player's stats resources draw piles add card method, and we'll duplicate the toxin card and just add it to the player's draw pile. Then we wait 0.25 seconds and tween the enemy back to its starting position. Pretty simple, right? And the final bit of the puzzle here is when the tween is finished, we always have to emit the enemy action completed signal from the event bus. Another thing we need to do is inside the update intent text because the default one which we have in the script template only uses the player's modifier, right? The damage taken modifier. But we also need to apply the enemy's damage dealt modifier to the value because again, this ghost buffs himself. So what we do is we say that the final damage will be that modified damage we grab from the player and then we modify it again but with the enemy's damage dealt modifier. And let's not forget that for the intent text we can no longer use that modified damage, we'll use the final damage variable instead. 
so we have to change this too. And that's it, that's the attack action done. So we can save this with Control S. And again, we should go back to 2D view because we have to set the inspector values for the attack action too. And it's pretty similar to what we did earlier. So we create a new intent resource. This time we do want to have a text next to the icon and it will be just the dynamic value of the damage that Ghost will currently do. So we just type in percent %s as a placeholder and for the icon we can load another icon. So I use this hammer plus potion icon indicating that it's not just an attack but also does something negative to you like debuffing you. Okay for the sound effect we can quick load something maybe the a basic enemy attack action sound and this one won't be a conditional action it will be a chance based one and the chance rate of this if we want it to be 65 percent probably the easiest thing to do is to make it 6.5 and the block action can be 3.5 so they add up to 10. Okay, we can save this with Control S and we are basically done with the attack action and we only have the block action left so we do pretty much the same select the node attach a script, make sure that it's an enemy action template and we just rename this to toxic ghost block action .gd. see what we want to delete again so if we scroll down we don't really want to do updated intent text for this so we can delete all of this and we don't really need twins either so we can delete all of those too Instead what we do is we provide an export variable for the amount of block that enemy wants to have which will be 10 for this one and then inside the perform action method we'll create a new block effect set the amount the sound effect and execute it on the enemy and just to make sure that it's not immediate we'll create a scene tree timer for 0.6 seconds and when it times out we can emit the event bus's enemy action completed signal for that enemy and that's it, that's probably the easiest one. We can save this with Control S. We can go back to 2D view and set this up in the inspector as well. So what we'll do is we'll create a new intent resource. We only want to use an icon here so the text can remain empty. And for the icon, we can load one of those shield icons we have. I'll just use this one. For the sound, we can quick load the enemy block sound and change this from a conditional to a chance based action as well and set the weight up to 3.5 so we have a 6.5 and a 3.5 weighted action those add up together to 10 and they have 65 and 35 percent chance of happening respectively okay so we can save this one more time with Control s and we're pretty much done with the enemy ai so you can just double check if all the actions are set up in the inspector as well it seems like they are and one final thing we need to do is if we're ready with this scene we can scroll back down to our toxic ghost enemy resource the enemy stats resource and you can see that the ai is still empty right but now that we are finished with the scene we can just drag and drop this ai scene right here like so save it again with Control s and we're pretty much done with designing the enemy if you like my content, please consider checking out my coffee page where you can donate one time or become a member and get early access to all my content and videos. So with the enemy design completed, the next thing we want to do is to actually design the battle and create the battle stats resource and finally add it to the pool of available battles in the game. So let's click on the plus sign to create a new scene. And we'll use a blank node 2D as a root node here. So click on 2D. And we can zoom in a bit just to see what's going on better. And we can rename this node to tier 2 toxic ghost or something like that. And all we need to do here is click on the instantiate child scene button and instantiate an enemy scene. And we can just go into move mode by pressing W and move this enemy to wherever we like. Something like this. Go back to select mode by pressing Q. And let's not forget that we need to provide the stats for the enemy for this to work. So what we do is we just drag and drop the toxic ghost resource we just created and save this scene. We can go back to the root folder. We have a battles folder right here. So if we go to that battles folder, that's where we have all our existing battles and tier 2 toxic ghost.tscn is perfectly fine. So we can save this scene right here. And now we can scroll all the way up inside that file system panel 
and expand our petals folder. And you can see that it's not enough to just providing the scene. We also want to create a battle stats resource. So let's right click on the battles folder, create new resource and search for battle stats.gd. And we can call this one the same. So tier to toxic ghost.tres. And if we double click the new resource, we can first of all drag and drop the scene we just created, like so, for the enemy's property. Change the battle tier to 2 because this will be a boss fight. And we can set the weight to whatever we want to. I just set it to one because that's the only boss fight we'll have. And we could set the gold reward, but you don't usually get gold from boss fights in Slay the Spire. We can set it if we want to. I just set it between 20 and 40, but whatever, for testing purposes. Okay, so that's pretty much what we need from the battle stats. But let's not forget that we also need to add it to the pool, right? Because when we generate the map, the map generator picks from this battle stats pool. So let's double click on our battle stats pool resource. And you can see that we only have four added battle stats, but now we have five different ones. So let's just click on the arrow to add a new one to this array. And we can drag and drop our tier two fight. And that's all we need to set it up. We could now test this, but the problem is it's pretty hard and time consuming to start a new run and reach all the way up to the boss fight, right? So it's probably easier to test this if just temporarily what we do is we select our tier two toxic ghost battles test resource again and change the tier to zero to make sure that it appears at the very beginning and crank the way all the way up to 10 to make sure that we have a pretty big chance of running into this fight. So let's save this with control S and start a new run and see if we can test our toxic ghost battle. So if I go into a battle, I have a pretty big chance of encountering that ghost. Now let's see if the buffing action works. It's the first turn and the intent says that the ghost wants to buff himself. So I just use my attack cards and my turn. And you can see that indeed that ghost gained two muscle, right? It deals two more damage. And now he wants to do the attack plus toxin card action. So let's see if that works. So if I play my muscle form here and end my turn, I do get that toxin card added to my deck. And you can see that it costs one mana. And if I play it, it subtracts the mana and it doesn't get added to my discard pile. So that kind of works when we do have a problem. Did you see that? It says that he wants to attack me for 8, but it's not right because I took 10 damage. And 10 is the correct one because he has 2 muscle, right? So something's up with the intent. But you can see that when I attack him and goes under 25, instead of attacking me, he goes into the buffing state again. And indeed, now he has 4 muscle. And instead of 12, the intent says 10. So there's something up with this. And we can investigate for sure. Okay, so let's bring him really low. The whole thing still works because I took 12 damage. And a new Toxin card got added to my deck. I can still play it to get rid of it. And I can win the battle just like I can with any of those. And I get 22 gold rolled as a reward. Okay, so pretty much everything's working as intended, except for the intent number for the enemy. So let's see how we can fix this. Okay, so let's investigate what the problem might be. Let's open the attack action because it seems like the problem lies here. Okay, so if we take a look at our update intent text method, it's indeed where the problem lies. And it's a pretty silly mistake I made. So we use this line of code here, this modified damage variable declaration from the script template, right? And in the script template, the value we want to get the modified version of is this constant six value. And that's not right for us because if we scroll all the way up, we have an export variable called damage, which stores the damage this action does, and it's 8 by default. So the problem is super simple to fix. Instead of using this 6 value, we just have to use our damage variable here. And this should fix everything. So if we save the script with Control S and go into a battle again, we should be able to see the fixed updated version. So I'll just play some cards here. Okay, he went into a blocking action instead of attacking this turn. Okay, so, so now we can see that it updates to 10, which is the correct value here. 
pretty cool. So I can block for 10. I take no damage, but a toxin is added to my draw pile. And if I attack again and again, he buffs himself. And you can see that it updates correctly now to 12. So everything works fine now. And this boss fight is fully functional. So one thing we have to do before we wrap this up is if we go back to 2D view, let's not forget to double click on this tier 2 toxic ghost battle stats resource and change it back to battle tier 2. Okay, just to make sure that it stays a boss fight for the game. And we can save this with control S. And the final thing we want to do in this video is to provide a win condition for the game. Because right now we don't handle winning the whole game by beating the boss. So that's what we'll do next. Okay, so to kick off handling the win condition inside the game, we want to create a new scene when the player actually wins a run. So as a starting point, just to make sure that we don't have to start from scratch, I'll just use the character selector screen we already have. So I press Ctrl Shift O to quick open a scene and search for character selector.tscn. And we don't need almost any of these, but we'll keep the background, the portrait and some parts of the text. First of all, let's go to scene save scene as and if we go back one folder inside the scenes folder we can create a new one called win screen and we can save this as win screen.tscn and when we are sure that we have the win screen opened up we can change the root node's name to win screen and we can start deleting stuff we don't need so the character buttons can go title can go as well and we can keep all of the other ones but we rearrange them and rename things a bit so we'll have a vbox container with a label and the start button we have the character portrait we can move this maybe between those two and we have the background we can rename this from character text to something like vbox container just a plain old name we can rename the description to something like message and we can also rename the start button to main menu button like so we see that we have a signal connected to this button but we need a new script for the windscreen we don't want to use the character selectors one so we can go into node signals and this pressed signal should be disconnected so right click on it and press disconnect and for the windscreen we can detach the script which is the character selectors one so click on the detach script button and before doing the coding part we can sort of rearrange things to make it look a bit nicer so first of all let's grab the vbox container set the anchor preset to the center go back to the inspector tab and maybe set like bigger separation between the elements so let's go to theme overrides constants and set the separation to something like 20. Then we can select the message label node, change the message itself to something like the warrior is victorious, maybe. Everything else I think is fine. And we can select the main menu button, change the text to main menu. Also, if we go to layout, we can set the custom minimum size to something like 14. And on the X, it can be something like 50. And just to make sure that it doesn't take the whole space in the VBox container, under control, we have container sizing. And you can see that on the horizontal, it's set to fill. And instead, we want to shrink center. And you can immediately see the effect of this. Maybe we can make it a bit wider, something like 60. And it already starts shaping up to look much nicer. So we can select the VBox container again, and we really don't need it to be this big. So let's go to layout, transform, and click on the arrow to reset the size of this. And you can immediately see the effect. And we can just anchor it back to the center again. And when we are finished, we can go into move mode by pressing W, press and hold shift and start dragging it to the right maybe something like this. And while we are in move mode, I can select the character portrait texture rect next, anchor this to the center as well. And in a similar fashion, I just press and hold shift and start dragging it to the left. Yeah, maybe something like this. Let's go back to select mode by pressing Q and we can save the scene with control S. Visually, that's pretty much what we want. And now we can move on to the scripting part. So let's select the windscreen, node, the root node, click on the attach script button. We don't really need a template for this, but windscreen.gd is perfectly fine. 
we can press create. And before we jump into coding, let's connect that main menu button. Press signal again. So select the main menu button node, go to node, signals, double click the pressed signal and connect to it. So what do we do here? First of all, we'll provide a custom class name called windscreen. Then we'll have two constants, one for the path to the main menu scene and one for the message we'll display inside that label. And you'll notice that again, we have a placeholder right here, this percent %s, where the name of the character will be inserted just to make it more dynamic. Then we'll have an export variable for the character stats resource, just so we have access to the art of the character, the image and the name, right? and we'll provide a custom setter function for it. Then we'll have two already variable references, one to the label, the message label, and one to the character portrait texture like node. And inside that setter function, we do three things. First of all, we'll set the character property or variable to the new character we want to change it to. For the message, we set the text property for that label and we replace the placeholder with the character's name. And for the character portrait texture acts texture property, we'll just use the portrait from the character resource. One last thing we need to do is to handle that main menu button pressed signal. And what we do is we call the scene trees change scene to file method with the main menu path. And this will load back the main menu scene. So we can start a new run or quit the game or whatever it is we want to do when we won a run. And that's pretty much it for the windscreen. So we can save this with control S. And the final thing we need to do is to actually hook this up. But before we hook this up, we can test if it works or not just by its own. So let's go back to 2D view and run the current scene by clicking on this button or pressing F6. And if we run the scene, we have our main menu button. And if I click on it, I go back to the main menu. Awesome. So the button works. The only thing we need to do is hook it up inside the run scene. So let's press Ctrl Alt O and search for run.gd. And the first thing we definitely need is a constant reference to that new windscreen scene, right? So we can instantiate it when we need it to. So that's one thing. But how do we handle going to that windscreen? Well, if we take a look at the methods we have, we do have one called onBattle1. And what we do when a battle is won, we instantiate the battle reward scene, inject the dependencies, add the gold reward and the card reward. And that's fine and pretty much what we need to do almost always, right? Well, except for when we defeat the boss. So we want to differentiate between winning every other battle and winning the last battle against the boss. So what we can do is grab all these pieces of code here because that's what we have to do when we want regular battles, right? So we can press Ctrl X to cut all these lines of code and making sure that we can paste it to a new method. So we'll extract out this functionality to its own method. So these callback methods, which are start with on, I always like to keep them at the end of the script. So let's go to our setup top bar method, which is the first one that doesn't start with on. We can insert a new method here, which will be called show regular battle rewards. And it does exactly the same thing as we did before when we won a battle. Same pieces of code, right? Just pasted it back with control V. And with this done, we can go back to our battle one, which is empty for now, right? And instead, what we do here is exactly that, separating those two instances, defeating a boss or defeating anything else. So what we do, is we check if the floors climbed currently is equal to the number of floors we have, because if that's the case, it means that we climbed the last floor, which is the bosses, right? And if so, what we do is we change the view to the windscreen scene and inject that character dependency to make sure that the character's portrait and text is updated. But if that's not true, so in all the other cases, we go to regular battle rewards and do the thing we did before, right? Pretty easy. That's all we need to do to close the game loop. And now we have a win condition. So let's save this with control S and now we should test it, right? But it's kind of tedious to like play the whole game just to test if it works. So what we can do instead is, is do something a bit cheeky and insert a cheating action for us to make it easier to go through battles. So let's go to project, project settings and inside input map, we can create a new action. I just call this cheat. And for the cheat action, we can press whatever button we want to. I just use Q because why not? And we can do something really simple, but powerful here. 
if we go all the way up to our ready callback inside the run, we can do something like this. Check for the event is action pressed, and if we pressed the cheat signal, we'll use get read.call group, which is a really handy method. So what you can do is you can grab a whole group of nodes, right? In this case, every node from the enemies group and call the queue free method on each and every one of them. So this basically just instantly deletes all the enemies from the battle. So now it will be much easier to test if that game loop and winning the game works. So we can save this with control S, start a new run, and let's see if I can breeze through the game. And finally, I arrived at the boss fight. So let's see if I can beat him. Okay, so I've beaten the boss. Hopefully I won't go into the battle rewards screen when I click on awesome and instead we'll see the win screen. And indeed we do. So we successfully close the game loop because if I click on main menu, we go back to our main menu and we can start a new run. Pretty awesome, right? So that's it for this video. And I guess I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.